Call the September 6, 2022 meeting of the City Council to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Will do. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderman Williams. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderwoman Purchase. Here. Alderwoman Desenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donlin. Here. Alderman Hanar. Here. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, we do have two presentations uh, for the ones for CWLP regarding the sequestration project. I'd like to come forward. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, we asked uh, for an update. Um, so uh, Kevin O'Brien, uh, he's the director of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center and also the Illinois State Water Survey. So uh, this is the group that we partnered with, um, and they kind of spearheaded the process for the carbon capture, uh, you know, pilot, large pilot project. Again, remember, it's, it's not a full scale, it's a small, just to prove the technology, but um, I'll, I'll let Kevin kind of give the update, um, you know, because we're, we're we're moving forward, so this is uh, perfect timing. Okay, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Well, first, thank you for the opportunity to present here, Mayor, Mayor, City Council. I'm excited to be able to update you as to the progress with this project, and uh, that I wanted to mention just beforehand, uh, this is very unique, and I think it will really put Springfield. Uh, in the global eye, so to speak, and that's what I want to present to you in, in these presentation. Real quickly, I just wanted to let you know, uh, we're the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center and the State Water Survey, we're part of the Prairie Research Institute. The Prairie Research Institute is one of the largest research institutes under the University of Illinois. I've listed there just some of the things that uh, we do under the Prairie Research Institute. And of course, that last bullet point, sustainable energy solutions, is what we're gonna be really focusing on in on this report. So first, I think it's important also for many of you, some of you may know about Prairie Research Institute and what we've done in carbon capture and so forth, but just to make sure we're on the same page, I wanted to tell you a little bit as to how we work together in this. And actually, this project is a great example of how we've kind of come together and made this happen. So as I got there, um, I mentioned Prairie Research Institute is under the University of Illinois, but we talk about there's then five surveys which are part, that are under that umbrella research of the Prairie Research Institute. And the first one, the one of the ones that I run is the Sustainable Technology Center. That is responsible for looking at specifically the carbon capture piece. So how you actually extract that CO2 from the flue gas. We, our sister survey, the state geological survey, is the one that's responsible for storage. So in other words, they look at injecting the CO2 uh, underground. Now, whenever you do this though, the other surveys also get involved, and here's a great example for this project. The state water survey that I run gets involved looking at are there any water issues involved here? The archeological survey gets involved because you need to be aware of a, what's called a discovery plan. Are there any potential artifacts there? And then of course the natural history to make sure there is no endangered species. So this is a great project where we've all worked together very closely 
to make sure that this project moves forward in a positive manner. And um, all I wanted to say here is we've worked with a lot of different projects. We've worked with a lot of engineering firms. And uh, there's a number of, number of reasons why we're the prime in this particular project, one of them being we have an excellent relationship with the Department of Energy, and uh, we're really set up to uh, run these types of projects. Real quickly here, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea. Uh, this is one of many projects that we're running for the Department of Energy, and just to give you a, a feel for, uh, I think the exciting thing is from an intellectual perspective, uh, we at the University of Illinois, I think you would consider to be one of the global leaders when it comes to carbon capture utilization and storage. So I just wanted to again quickly go through to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, when we talk about ca carbon capture utilization and storage, or CCUS, there's some important things that we need to be aware of. And the first is that uh, much like we're talking about here, we're talking about a process to take the flue gas, the flue gas that right now goes up the stack at CWLP, and essentially remove the CO2 from the, the flue gas. That's the important thing when we talk about capture. Now, once you've captured that CO2, there's a number of things you can do with it. For example, as I've listed there, you can utilize it. So you can utilize it to grow algae, you can put it into concrete, you can use it to make chemicals. There's a number of different options there. And then, of course, if you don't utilize it, you can also store it geologically. It's important to emphasize what we're doing here for this project is simply the capture piece. We're, we are given the, the direction from the Department of Energy, we need to demonstrate that this capture process actually exists because it's a, it's a new capture process that we're testing. And again, just to give you a feel, uh, we've, we've got up there kind of the blue and the, the red dots to will symbolize the, the, the carbon dioxide and the nitrogen that right now is getting emitted uh, up the stack. And when we talk about capture, there's really a couple things that we talk about is we need to look at a percent capture and we need to look at what is the purity of the CO2 which is produced. And as you can see there, I mean, the bottom line is, for example, you want to get um, a, a percent capture translates into, you know, what percentage of the red balls do we get out? So that's your percent capture. And then what's the purity? In, in other words, did I only get, uh, you know, red, uh, did I only get red balls out there? So the key thing is, of course, you want to get to a high capture rate and you want to get to high purity. So that's the, the really important thing when we do these tests and we evaluate these technologies, those are the two factors that we look at. So uh, in this slide, just wanted to say that uh, people often ask, does capture work? The answer is yes, it really does work. Um, and one of the key things, as I'm sure many of you heard with this, uh, the recent passage of legislation at the federal level has really encouraged even more carbon capture, not only off of power plants, but now there's a push to capture it off of industrial facilities like uh, cement plants, steel plants, chemical plants. And part of that is all related to these federal tax credits, the 45Q, which uh, has been talked about quite a bit. So this whole process of doing carbon capture it's a huge, huge research program, which at the federal level, the administration is very much behind, very supportive, and it's being, um, it's being adopted, again, not only by power plants, but by industrial facilities. So the important message to you is by doing these tests at City Water, Light, and Power now, there's no doubt, we will get other people from industrial facilities, power plants, coming over to see how this goes and to understand how this technology works. And to me, that's the exciting piece that we see happening for the, uh, for the city of Springfield. So let me just delve down now and update as to where we are with this project. And uh, this is a really exciting opportunity to give you an idea of 
of where we progress. We've, we've come a long way with this project and we're excited to see it continue. Uh, the first thing for, for many of you, I just wanna review, how did we get here? What was the selection process? And um, I, on this slide, I wanted to show you that really this was a process that started back in 2017 when the DOE started to release a call for proposals. And in that, we put together a uh, proposal with uh, City Water, Light and Power, proposing them to be the host site. We went through a feasibility study, uh, then to a design study, and now we're in the phase three, the build and operate. And the thing I wanted to point out to you is, this was not a slam dunk. This was a very, very competitive process where you can see you went from nine to five to finally two projects were selected and we were one of those uh, that were selected. This is a significant project, it's 67 million. Uh, we're actually going out and building and we're operating it. So the goal here is to provide benefits to the local unions, to the local economy, uh, you know, putting people to work and also utilizing some of the people, some of the operators that are currently there at the plant, so. So uh, just to give you an overview, I've tried to show here on the diagram uh, what we've got. We've got the uh, Dolman 4 unit. It's that unit which uh, we're gonna be doing the capture off of. That triangle up there shows you where that uh, capture pilot is gonna be located. And I also wanted to show you, we've also got a smaller scale of course, but we've got an algae utilization pilot going on there as well. So the exciting thing, and I'm gonna focus on the capture piece is, again, this whole vision that uh, we wanna be a leader in not only capture, but also looking at utilization. And we see this, if this particular technology works, CWLP could well be the place where people say, you know, I have a new technology to utilize the CO2. Where can I test it out at the pilot level? The obvious answer would then be go to CWLP in Springfield and do that testing. So we see some, some future great opportunities as this project moves forward. So uh, now I wanna drill down specifically on how we're doing with that large capture project. Um, there is our lead engineer, Stephanie Brownstein. Uh, the project, 67 million. Uh, this is again a what we refer to a, as a post combustor caption, capture system. So we're taking that flue gas just before it goes up the stack. We're pulling it off, running it through the capture unit just to demonstrate that we can actually capture the CO2 as promised. <clears throat> and this is now, as an engineer, this is the fun stuff for me to show. Uh, this is the current design that we're now, you know, going to be moving forward in building. Uh, what you can see here is a couple things. Uh, those three stacks, those are going to be the what are called the, absorb the absorber, the stripper, and the direct contact cooler. Uh, those are part of the whole process itself. You can see kind of a bluish, greenish outline there. That's going to be where the unit is going to be located. Uh, we have the green, which is the ducting, which will run over from the existing plant over to this capture facility. And the red on the left-hand side, that's gonna be the utilities that will be coming off of the power plant over to this capture facility. Now, um, and that kind of small caption that I have there, that gives you what that three-dimensional design is gonna look like. So that when this is final, finally completed, that's what you're gonna expect to see. Uh, over at uh, City Water, Light and Power. So we're excited to have the design done. We're now at the stage of going through and doing procurements, selection of various contractors. And uh, right now we're on track to break ground uh, towards the end of this month, the end of September. So it's, it's really an exciting time to be moving forward and to maybe do a little bit of bragging, we're probably ahead of the other project that's been selected. So, um, you know, go Illinois for this one. So uh, we're, we're, leading, we're leading the pack. So uh, again, to talk a little bit as to where we are with this, as I mentioned, 
Uh, here's, I wanted to show some pictures are always fun. Right now we've been doing, back in July, we did some soil sampling. That's really important because you have to understand from a soil perspective, make sure that you have the right type of support when you put that capture plant in, in place. Um, the other thing that we had a big contractor walk through, that was done back in July. Uh, so that was again an exciting opportunity to get people in, have them look, and then put bids in on being able to do, in this case, the civil work, which will be the, the groundbreaking work, which we're gonna see pretty soon. The other thing uh, that's really exciting, we talked about before when we were here, the opportunity to create high visibility for CWLP and Springfield. And we talked about there's gonna be people coming in internationally, there's gonna be people coming in from the Department of Energy. A lot of people are gonna to wanna to come here and see the progress of this project. And then, like I said, as some follow-on work, they're gonna to wanna to be testing their technologies. And just to show you, that's already happening. In fact, um, what I'll show you there, whoops, is uh, we had a major site tour by the Department of Energy. And they came out, those are some pictures from that tour. They were very anxious to see where we were with the project. They wanted to see the CWLP site. Um, by the way, CWLP has an extremely positive reputation at the Department of Energy because of its uh, CWLP's willingness to get involved in looking at capture. So um, already Springfield's on the map in that they've got the attention of the Department of Energy. So we feel really, really good about that. The other thing that's exciting is uh, we've talked with the International Carbon Capture Test Network. And as you can see up there, I mean, there's a broad series of people that do testing here. And they're all linked together through the National Carbon Capture Center which is sponsored by the Department of Energy. And uh, the exciting thing is this October, there's a major international meeting called the Greenhouse Gas Technology Meeting, which will be bring, bringing together researchers from out the globe to kind of share their latest stories. The good news, we will be presenting on this project at City Water, Light and Power. And the other better news is that um, I've talked with them and they're gonna be considering having City Water, Light and Power join that international test network, which again, uh, the advantage as you can see there obviously from a scientific perspective is sharing knowledge and so forth, but it's also gonna mean people interested in coming here to Springfield and looking at doing tests on the unit, um, you know, here at City Water, Light and Power. So um, again, I see we're now planting the seeds for Springfield, City Water, Light and Power to really get that international exposure that we talked about before and having people coming in from a tourism perspective, wanting to see the unit, wanting to test things and really, you know, helping to, you know, our goal is add to that map, uh, the city of Springfield and City Water, Light and Power. So, um, and again, uh, just to something we talked about before uh, the idea of creating jobs. Uh, one of the things is some of the operators uh, who were, as a result of shutting down those other units, uh, taking them and they could be employed to, uh, as a result of operating the unit for this project. It's a, another way, you know, if the technology works well, provides another means to help uh, decarbonize uh, our utility grid here in Illinois and also support our ongoing focus on how to reduce carbon emissions. I talked about the regional, regional economic growth through tourism uh, and the exciting thing, again, to come back to this recent federal uh, legislation, that's really been a game changer in that Inflationary Reduction Act. And it's shown that down the line, CO2 actually can be monetized through either tax credits or through direct payments. So a lot of really exciting opportunities there. And the last bullet point, we've really done a lot here in Illinois. We've been a global leader in CCUS, and uh, I think the testament, uh, testament to that is now City Water, Light and Power being considered for uh, being a member of that International 
test network. So at that point, I'll stop. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, share this with you. We're excited. And uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank both the mayor and the city council for your belief in this project and your willingness for us to move forward. Uh, I think we're paying off in dividends for the city, and we hope to continue to do so. So, well, Thank you very much. Uh, Alderman McMinimum. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. That was outstanding. Could we go back to the, the final slide? Sure. Uh, let's see. There we go. Let me flip through here. Sorry about that. That might take a time. while. I can yeah. jump to the question. If sure. You um, the, the, la the second to last bullet, uh, you, you mentioned how with federal legislation we can monetize the carbon dioxide through 45Q. 45Q refers to what? 45Q is, uh, that was originally uh, some legislation they talked about the, before this passed. It was uh, the 45Q talked about uh, tax breaks. So in other words, the deal originally was uh, you would get $50 a ton from, in terms of a tax break for each CO2 that you uh, store geologically. Now it's changed it's to $85 a ton if you store it geologically. If you utilize it rather than store it, now under the new legislation you will get $50 a ton. So that's been a huge change in terms of increasing those values. And the other major change that's happened is rather than just being a tax credit, what it is now is uh, essentially rather than a tax payment, you can also do a direct pay. So for somebody like, for example, the city that in CWLP that's not going to care about a tax credit, you could essentially get a direct payment from the government for that. So. And 45Q means what? That's a great question. I, I, it's just a terminology we use. I'm sure it's something related to kind of in the tax legislation and so forth. Okay. So. And so during this implementation of this pilot phase, there's no monetary gain for the city. There's a lot of notoriety, which is very good, and, right. and labor is employed yep. and a lot of indirect benefits. Nothing to the city budget yet. That's right, for this particular project. Now, if it moves on, then there, there opens up a range of possibilities. Yes, that's correct. And do you wish to make any comments about what the range of those possibilities might be in terms of their monetary value? Uh, well, it's speculative. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I can't do the math fast enough, but I mean, we're talking about here, uh, you know, a 10 megawatts, so it's a slipstream. But I know that under the new legislation, it, it will be. It, you, in the past, you couldn't, but you can now. But I, I couldn't give you an exact number at this point, but could always get back to you with that. All right, thank you. Yep. Alderman Redpath. Thank you for your presentation. It's very exciting for, for us in the city of Springfield to have this project come to us. Um, how much of the CO2 will it capture? Is, that, is it completely captured? So um, the goal originally was <clears throat> 90% when we started this project. But now uh, the federal guidelines, they're, they're still saying 90%, but they would like us to see if we can push it to 95%. And we, when we've talked to Lindy BASF, they believe, believe that's possible. So we're talking about potentially up to 95% capture for this. So is this a potential that if, uh, if this project works in a, in a bigger scale, that it, get, that it revitalizes the ability for us to use coal? Well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll state, state it in this fashion. It certainly opens up possibilities of uh, now you are able to come out and say, I can do a 95% capture of CO2, uh, which I think, you know, provides the opportunity to look at a lot of other options. Is it, is it uh, financially feasible, though? I mean... I, I'll, I'll say this, and this is why I personally was so excited about the Inflationary Reduction Act. A lot of projects that might not make it in the past, most people that I talk to now uh, investors and so forth have indicated now their, their projects pencil out. They're now in the black 
because of the changes, this $85 a ton, $50 a ton. So it, it is certainly very positive. Well, again, this is an exciting program for, for us, and I know local labor, labor is very excited about it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring a lot of jobs for us. Thank you. Alderman Williams. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming, and I appreciate the report. Uh, the neighborhoods in the area, so is there any uh, uh, danger or increase of negative impacts that would affect the closest neighborhoods that surround, or will it stay the same? We've tried as much as possible, uh, possible to identify if there's going to be any issues. Uh, we've not seen any yet, but one of the other things that we're doing as part of this project is um, there is going to be an environmental justice piece, and we're just started into that. We're working very closely with CWLP on that, and that is going to be one of the things that we look at with this project, and that's one of the things required for the DOE to look at. So. Yeah, I appreciate that because I, I did want to know if there was going to be a point that um, we kind of explained some of this moving forward to the communities that surround uh, that are closest to the plant. Yeah. Thank and you. And we plan to work through CWLP for that, absolutely. Okay, appreciate you. Alderman Donlin. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Brien. This was a great presentation. I appreciate you coming to Springfield to update us. Uh, my question really kind of builds upon the first question that deals with the uh, potential revenue stream. You mentioned on slide 10, you talk about utilizing the carbon for the potential growth of algae and uh, production of concrete, making of chemicals, and then of course you touched upon the tax credit part. How likely are those, uh, the algae, the concrete, and the chemicals, sure. how likely are those items in particular to uh, bring revenue to the city? That, that's a great question. And uh, what I can back that up with is we have a separate project going on uh, let's talk about the cement piece first. We have a separate project going on up in Chicago where we're going to be capturing CO2. And then uh, there's a company by the name, and maybe you've heard about it in the news, uh, Carbon Cure. Carbon Cure has a commercial process to take that CO2 and inject it into cement. The cement actually becomes stronger as a result of that injection. And uh, we're doing a project up in Chicago you know that's focused on that so this is already being done commercially so it's there's definitely an opportunity there with the algae uh, that's not as far along from a commercial perspective but what we're looking at here we've done a number of studies uh, and we're actually doing probably the most advanced work here at CWLP where we're going to be taking the co2 and we've <coughs> demonstrated on smaller scale this is a bigger scale to be able to grow that algae then we can harvest that, and we can use the algae for either animal feed or biochar, and biochar is a great soil amendment, so it's gonna be a lot of interest to uh, the agricultural surrounding. So um, I wanna emphasize, this isn't just something that we've drawn up and said, yeah, this would be a good idea. This has been vetted and tested, and uh, especially the exciting thing is this project, the algae project is kinda going on simultaneously along with this particular uh, pilot thing. So I feel that uh, there's no technical barriers that we've seen to date to prevent me from saying that this, these are great ways to utilize the CO2. Well, I appreciate that uh, information. I pre again, appreciate you coming. This is cutting edge and very exciting. Thank you. Alderwoman Purchase. Thank you, Mayor. Following up behind Alderman Donnellan, how long will this process take to remove the CO2? Well, uh, so what we'll be doing is uh, this particular project is scheduled to run for approximately two years to demonstrate that the, te the technology works. Now, our anticipation is that after that two years, uh, we'll talk with City Water, Light, and Power, and I know essentially with all of you, to see whether that's a unit that you all want to keep. If you decide we are really excited about this, this makes sense, then um, we see this as an opportunity to then, as I talked about before, turn this into a test facility, be able to monetize it through some various ways and so forth. Uh, so the actual test itself is about two years to kind of give you an idea, so. Okay, and then will you be given Director Brown updates to provide us with as you all are going through the process and doing Absolutely. the renovations? Okay. Absolutely, and we hope at some point that you all will come out and 
take a look at the unit itself. So uh, frankly, I, I love to give these types of talks. Uh, carbon capture has been my passion. I've worked on it since 1999. And to me personally, the exciting thing is I've worked in the lab and now to finally see this coming through, it's been something I've wanted for my entire career. So I'm always happy to talk about it and update people as to its uh, status. Thank you, and I would love to come and see that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate <clears throat> thank it. You. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Treg Durson with Related Midwest. He's going to come give us an update on the Poplar Place project. Craig, those are for the uh, council members. All right. Uh, good evening. I'm Mayor Langfelder and City Council. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Treg Durson. I am uh, affordable housing uh, development associate with Related Midwest. Uh, Related, we're a uh, global real estate developer. We're one of the largest in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Uh, we focus on uh, affordable housing as well as uh, luxury development. In affordable housing, we uh, own, operate, and manage uh, roughly 10,000 units in the state of Illinois. And uh, Popular Place, we've been the owner of Popular Place since uh, 1999. Uh, I've joined you tonight to present a redevelopment plan that we are uh, very excited about uh, and we look forward to uh, getting your feedback on. So an overview on Poplar. Poplar was constructed in 1950. It was originally a military barracks. Uh, it was, has since obviously been converted to uh, multifamily development, I think roughly around the 70s or 80s. Anyway, it's 142 uh, building structures, most of which are townhomes, to which would comprise of 244 units across 23 acres. Uh, as I mentioned, we've owned the property since 1999. Since 1999, uh, the property has suffered from uh, an issue of low occupancy. You know, currently on Poplar, I'm sure many of you are aware, there's only 15% uh, occupancy on the site, which uh, you know, leads to a lot of units that are uh, dilapidated. Uh, some need to be demolished and many need to be uh, fully rehabbed. Uh, we've come up with a redevelopment plan in partnership with the Springfield Housing Authority, as well as their uh, local nonprofit, their affiliated nonprofit, the Capital City Coalition uh, NFP. Uh, in this redevelopment, 100% uh, of the units will remain affordable. Uh, all of the units will be at 60% uh, AMI or less. And over the course of the past 16 months, we've interacted with uh, CWLP as well as Public Works to really understand the site and all, all the things that need to go into uh, improving the roads and changing utility conditions. So the proposed redevelopment will cost uh, $38 million. Uh, that includes about $21.5 million in hard costs, which is about uh, $215,000 per unit. Uh, it, we are going to de-densify the site. Uh, currently, there are 142 structures. We'll demolish 67 of them to end up with 75 uh, buildings. 
Uh, 25 of those buildings will be remain duplexes to consist of 50 units. The others will be uh, 50 single family homes. Uh, as you can see, the unit mix here uh, will be mostly two bedrooms. There'll be 43 bedrooms and then uh, four 10 bedrooms that will be four bedroom, 10 units uh, that will be ADA uh, compliant units. Also a part of the unit mix uh, with the partnership of the housing authority, 25%, so 25 units will have a project-based voucher uh, supplied by the Springfield Housing Authority. Uh, other site enhancements include creating a new main entrance off of Old Rochester Road, uh, relocating the management office to the center of the site and building a new management office and community center. Uh, given the amount of demolition, there'll be uh, a great opportunity to provide an open green space and a playground. Uh, as lastly, as well as to repave the, the road conditions at Poplar. So here's the existing site plan. You know, as you can see, there's uh, a lot of structures across the site. Um, you know, we, we strongly believe by de-densifying the site, it will become a, a better place to live. And here is the proposed uh, site plan. Here's a breakout of the, of the hard cost. So the, the construction is gonna be a gut rehab of all the structures. And you know, in doing a gut rehab, it's really gonna be the main mechanicals, so plumbing, electrical, HVAC, new roof, uh, will be a large portion of the construction uh, budget, as well as uh, demolition. Uh, relocation. So I wanted to touch on how we're going to do it. So here is a site map. We've broken out the site map in different phases. Uh, the green color is phase one, and then the blue and purple are phase two and phase three. Uh, most of the current residents at Poplar live in the purple area, uh, the north end of the property. There are a few residents that live on the southern end, roughly about uh, 10 households. Uh, what we're proposing is, well, first, we need to ensure that no household is negatively impacted uh, by the renovation. That includes during the renovation and after the renovation. So for the households that can remain on the property during renovation, which will be on the northern end of the property, uh, we are proposing to keep them within their homes, and then once the southern portion is completely redeveloped, we will move them into a new unit. Uh, for the southern portion of the site, it will be more difficult to keep them in place given all of the demolition that's going to happen as well as the change in uh, utilities. Uh, currently, Poplar uh, is gas and electric. We are, we are pursuing a plan that will be fully electric, uh, so some of the gas lines will, will be cut and abandoned. Um, and in that time, we will uh, relocate residents to another apartment outside of Poplar uh, current and if their rent increases from being outside of the property, we will pay that difference to ensure there's no negative impact to them. We'll also pay uh, moving expenses to, uh, to relocate them off the property as well as back on the property. And they will have a right to return to the property. And in their returning of the property, uh, their rent will not change for roughly uh, three years. Uh, project schedule. So we are in for permits uh, currently. Uh, we've got uh, permit approval for the residential buildings. Uh, we just came, went back to the city on comments for the community center. That's a commercial permit. So we should work through that uh, and be, you know, fully have full permits for the project by October. Uh, Ida is, um, you know, a big partner in this development. We've uh, already gone through some initial loan committees with Ida and are on their schedule to be at an October board. And um, you know, we're pursuing a December close with Ida. And with a December close, that would then enable us to start construction as early as January. Uh, the construction period will be 18 months. Um, and then the lease up following construction will be uh, three months potentially even less. We, we think this is an area that uh, has a high demand for affordable housing, 
uh, and especially given the additional uh, project-based vouchers provided by the Springfield Housing Authority that will help us get there. So wh why, why will this development succeed and um, what's, what's different from last time? Well, first, uh, you know, in 1999, early 2000, the renovation budget was relatively low. It was probably about $10,000 a unit. And as you can see, at $215,000 a unit, it's really going to be a completely uh, revamped and new product. And we feel strongly that um, there's a lot of aging product on the east side of Springfield. And with this renovation, we'll probably have, uh, you know, the nicest product uh, on that side of, of Springfield, especially for affordable housing. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a substantial amount of de demand in affordable housing. So the lease up period for three months uh, should be well achieved. Uh, additionally, you know, we're excited to have local partners part of the development. So um, our architect is Tim Smith with Evan Lloyds. Uh, he's helped design uh, the project. He's also gonna stay on during construction to supervise the project. Uh, the Springfield Housing Authority, in addition to providing their public project-based vouchers, they're gonna ultimately be the property manager. And with the housing authority being the property manager of the development, uh, that gives us a, a stronger ability to be more cost efficient with our operations, as well as for them to leverage their adjacent properties uh, and tenant vouchers to lease up the property. So we think we, we would have a strong uh, partnership with them. Uh, security enhancements, uh, I've met with the uh, police department uh, a couple of times over these past 12 months They've asked to ensure that we have license plate readers on the property, which we will, as well as to install cameras in some of the uh, open green space locations so that they can have access to uh, those cameras. So we will ensure that there is a security plan in place and that we can work uh, in concert with the local police department. Uh, beautification and amenities. So the, the open green space is gonna create a, a nice place for people to enjoy and live. Uh, the single family homes will have a, a new uh, garage, a new single car garage, uh, which we think will be a nice amenity uh, for those individuals that have a single family home. Uh, Rebranding of the development. So uh, there's a, a lot of negative context around the name Poplar. We'd like to create a, a public page and a public uh, process to rename the property. Um, so we're looking forward to kicking that off uh, sometime this month. And then lastly, uh, as an experienced developer, um, both on the construction side and on the property management side, you know, we feel strongly about our ability to execute on the project, both from a financing perspective and a construction perspective. So here's a list of our, our sources and uses. So as I mentioned, the, the total project cost is $38 million. And to really give Prop Poplar what it needs, uh, full recapitalization and a reimagination of the property, uh, it's gonna require and need uh, all parties to come together uh, to make this happen, uh, as well as obviously the city of Springfield and city council. So included in my sources and uses is what's phrased as gap financing, which is the difference between what the property can afford based on operations and what's the missing cost based off of what's needed at the property. There's roughly a $6.25 million gap for Poplar. Uh, Ida has committed to providing 5.25 million to the project um, through grant proceeds that will ultimately be relent to the property as well as providing uh, a permanent mortgage and issuing bonds to support the project. Um, to make this become a reality, we will also need the city's support and a, a number of um, about a million dollars to close our financing gap. Uh, the other portions of the sources are low income housing tax credit equity. This is equity that's generated from having the property be affordable that's then ultimately uh, sold to banking institutions and insurance companies, for example. And then lastly, um, a donation tax credit note 
that will then be um, a seller note to the nonprofit that's part of the structure, uh, as well as some deferred developer fees. So I want to uh, stop there, uh, Mayor, and see if there's any questions. Alderman Williams, or do you have a question yeah. now? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can speak now. So um, thank you for coming. This is, well, you already know, we've been waiting a long time. Um, you know, way back before I got appointed, this was, was the issue. And, you know, we're still doing it. I'm not blaming your company or the city. I, I know I, I've learned a lot about Ida. And I know the numerous projects that Ida is involved in in Springfield and, and just how slow Ida can be. You know, uh, one of the biggest learning lessons I had when I was in there saying, let's just tear them all down, and they got to telling me about uh, low-income housing and affordable housing and how much is required by federal law that has to be available in Springfield and all those things that I never thought about. So in some of those meetings, I wouldn't have, I guess, on my best behavior, but um, I just want you to know it was never personal against related. I like related. I like what they did with Madison Park Place. When they did Madison Park Place, I mean, I, I like the overall project. I just was frustrated about the timing. But we're here now, and we need a million dollars from the city is basically what you're saying. You're bringing $32 million and then Ida's putting in another five, whatever, a million. I'm hoping we can get through this. I, I, I guess we're going to economic planning and development tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Is you know, So we'll go before them and do this plan and see, see what they recommend or, or what they find out. But I have a couple of things. So um, the first thing I want to say is that I've been getting calls about letters that some of the families have been getting. Can you explain that? So that because we're not the only ones listening, there's people listening. And I just want them to know exactly what's happening with those letters. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your question. Sure. So ultimately, uh, we issued letters to 10 households that were uh, severely delinquent on their rent. So numerous years uh, without a rent payment. There are roughly about 10 households. The letter provided them with, uh, in our opinion, a generous offer to uh, move off of the property. Uh, we offered 100% debt forgiveness as well as a voucher to cover moving expenses. Uh, of those 10 households, uh, five have accepted the offer, and there's one that um, is considering. Okay, appreciate that answer. So, and then on, on the design there, I can't see from here, but in, in our previous meetings, we had talked about uh, all the main entrances and exits being on, on old Rochester Road, the slanted road, you know, facing yeah. the new school. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the cut of sacs that were going to be created for Livingston and 25th Street, some of the, the neighborhood streets we were talking about. And I do realize you guys said, well, it's got to clear fi the fire department. You know, trucks have to, because it affects their time and all this. And I didn't know where we was at on that or if any of the cut of sacs got approved. Do you know the answer to that right well, now? There's, well, right now on the property, there's an existing barrier at Beach yes. Street. Yes, yes. Um, going into that uh, housing community up there, we're proposing keeping that barrier in place. Okay. Uh, there's another, there's two entrances off of uh, 25th Street. Yes. We're gonna put a temporary barrier on, uh, not Poplar, but Sherwood. Okay. Because okay. We, we, we believe that this will be a successful development mm -hmm. and that come a year from now, two years from now after it's stabilized, it will be a vibrant community and people will, it will be safe and people will kind of come in and out. So we think the, the barriers won't be needed in the medium to long term. And then on the other areas, to, to answer your question about the other side of Sherwood and Livingston, we thought it could be a, a fire issue. Um, so if it's not, it's something we're willing to look at, but we, okay. we, we thought it could be create some issues in terms of emergency. Uh, yeah, access. we was just trying to take the traffic out of the neighborhoods now that they got a main street 
they, they would be utilized and take them straight to South Grand or get on the main street to go to Cook instead of through the neighborhoods and that would stop some of the speeding complaints and some of the other undesirable complaints that happen coming out of there if they had less interest and exit. And speaking of the interest and exits on, um, that we're gonna be doing on Old Rochester Road, we had discussed that at those interest and exits would be these, these readers that you talked about and cameras. So at any given time, the police will know who came in and who came out. Is that still the situation? That's still the plan. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all I have for now, Mayor. Alderman Donnell? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate you coming this evening. This, this is uh, long overdue, exciting. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I noticed on a couple of the slides you had the existing layout and then the proposed layout mm -hmm. once the development is complete. And then the list of uses of the funds include acquisition cost. What, what do you mean by acquisition cost? Because that's a significant number. Just trying to better understand. Yeah, that. so um, in Illinois, there's an Illinois... Uh, housing tax credit that a nonprofit can utilize. So the acquisition cost of $9.6 million is the value of property of Poplar as of today. We are going to donate the property to the Capital City Coalition. The Capital City Coalition will then recommit the property into the development, which then creates this about $8.4 million of uh, donation credits that we can ultimately sell. Um, and then we've sold uh, $3.8 million of donation tax credits to U.S. Bank. So it's essentially just a, 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 a housing function and tool for us to realize more equity. Right. It's an economic development to, tool to makes the project sell. work. I get it. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And then uh, just as a, I'll, I'll just jump up. I wasn't going to ask this question, but something Alder, Alderman Williams said made me think of it. The city gap financing of a million dollars, do we have a source outlined? Well, that, that will be for, for you and the mayor to, <laughs> to determine. Okay, just, so that's a but, uh, conversation it, but coming the, up. But I will say right. this, like for, for, the, what the, for the sor whatever the source would be, the proper structure would, it, would be to then uh, donate it to the nonprofit. The nonprofit would then lend it back into the development so the development wouldn't have to pay taxes on it and we can use it to develop the property. And then, and then my final question is uh, uh, something, sort of a guilty, guilty pleasure of mine in the wintertime, and that is uh, we'll probably watch too much HGTV. So <laughs> I, 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 uh, you talked about utilizing the existing structures. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I've, I've been in Poplar Place many times throughout my life and career, but talk to me about the bones of the structures. I mean, is it a, I know they were built some years ago. I think you said the 50s. Uh, are the bones of the buildings that are there good? The, fo the foundations are good. Uh, so each building has a basement, and the foundation has a strong enough structure for us to build upon. Um, in the complete gut rehab of it, we found that there, uh, there needs more uh, sheeting on the buildings to ensure that the, the buildings are properly insulated. So because it was built in the 1950s, they're not as insulated as they should yeah, be. Things have changed a little bit, haven't they? Yeah, so that's that's uh, been an addition on our, on our cost and what we thought we could use and not reuse. But um, we'll have to completely take off the siding. The siding has uh, some asbestos on it, so we'll have to do abatement there. But it's really uh, a project that's going completely to the studs and and rebuilding it. Um, you know, with these projects, um, you really only have 15 years to get it right. Where I mean, like the the laws in place won't allow us to inject additional capital until a compliance period is complete, which is after 15 years. So we, it's very important to get the construction and the budget right the first time so you're not left with a product that deteriorates 10 years from now. Thank you for answering my questions and for the update again. Thank you. Alderman Conley. Thank you, Mayor, and yeah, thank you. This is very exciting. Um, my husband actually used to teach at the grade school right adjacent to Poplar Place, so it's, oh, it's nice to see such a major investment in that neighborhood. Um, I have just a couple of quick questions for mm -hmm. you, uh, and some of these are just, I'm looking at this as like a family home, and I saw that you have an appliance line item in there. Um, I'm just kind of wondering, what appliances are you going to be offering? Will it be 
will there be laundry in the house or will there be an, a place nearby for that or what's there'll be there'll be a laundry hookup in the house okay uh there won't be a laundry unit in the house um but all of the homes be, will have laundry connections available all of them will have laundry connections okay. um this was just from our experience from being the manager of madison park place uh, madison park place provided laundry units as well as the uh, hookups it just got to a point where there was very difficult to manage and you know once individuals took it upon themselves to provide the laundry unit the laundry <coughs> unit you know stayed in better condition so that's a uh, that's i just wonder i mean i've most i had three small children for a while and I, they, you need laundry <laughs> no absolutely so, but, but the, there okay. will be a laundry hookup and then um you know of course uh you know new refrigerator new electric stove <coughs> uh, a range a microwave a dishwasher uh, all the things someone would need to really be in your own home. Make a house a home. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, and then I know you've got a picture of the community center. You, you, you haven't really talked about that. Can you tell us a little bit about what the plan is for that? Yeah, so uh, right now, and I can bring this up here just so you, have, you can see it more visually. But um, this is a community center that will be about a little bit over 2,000 square feet. Um, it will have a management component to it where our property manager will be at the front of the door. Um, so they'll have eyes on the front as well as on the community aspect of the space. Um, we're also gonna build a little uh, office component that will have security cameras should uh, the police department wanna come by and look at footage or, or whatnot. But it will be a brand new space uh, there'll also be an adjacent parking lot to it. We think logistically it's the best move for the residents as well as for um, the safety of the property. So will this be a space that residents can, can rent, like if they want to have parties or? Oh, a a absolutely. So it meetings? would be a space that they can uh, rent w without charge if they're a resident. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, at our other properties that have community centers, there's a, they'll do uh, you know, baby showers mm -hmm. and birthdays. There'll be a kitchen uh, in the community center and TVs for people to use. So uh, it, it will really be an inviting space for someone to have uh, as a nice amenity for them. And that's going to be a completely new construction, right? Comple completely new construction, right? Is that going, I, I know you've lost the map, but that's kind of going in the center of the, the subdivision there? Yes, that's going right off... Uh, Oh, right off the new old, Chos old Rochester Road. Okay. Um, oh, it looks like I, I have one. Brown structure. Yeah, it's the, the brown, brown. It's the okay. brown structure right in the middle. I just want to make sure I didn't want to assume anything. But. Yeah, our, our current management office is on the north end, like the way top of the map, uh, top left, um, 902 South 25th Street. Uh, and as, as it's just away, too far away from the residents. Uh, probably makes it difficult for people to come out and see the property manager and for us to really know what's going on and maintain the property. And then, um, so just, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but you will be using union labor for all of the work? We are proposing, uh, our sub, as of right now, we're not proposing using union labor. Uh, we'd but like to, use, we'd funds? like to do a, uh, workforce development and community initiative to really stress the importance of having local hiring and supporting MBE, uh, WEB uh, businesses in that area. Um, and we think that would be the, the best benefit for um, that, that side of Springfield and for uh, the surrounding communities of Poplar. Okay. That is a little bit of a problem, just. I mean, I understand the concept behind that, but if, if you're saying you want to take city dollars into a project this large that could be providing, I mean, a, a lot of jobs, I don't know why that sort of a component couldn't go hand in hand with with a union work where they would also then, we know that people are getting like even apprenticeship positions and moving into that larger, you know, right into Well, it's, it's not a jobs. topic that, it's a topic that, we're willing to continue to have a discussion and, and conversation okay. about. Uh, we are gonna pay Illinois prevailing wage. Um, I, I do see and hear your point. There could be a scenario where it's a, a blended project. 
I would certainly encourage you to talk to, to our local building unions and okay. um, because I think that's a great idea. We obviously, the workforce development component is, is critical and we, we, I, I appreciate that you're, you're looking to that angle, but um, I, I think that's a conversation you probably want to continue to have. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Since it was just Labor Day, we got to bring Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Alderman Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, First, for the uh, city gap financing, you know, I, I, I fully support that. And I, I imagine you guys have a um, thought on where we would get that from. I would support that. And, you know, I also support the goal and the initiative to um, have a workforce that looks like the community that we're going to be building in. And, you know, in whatever way that we make that happen, we really want to see that happen, you know, for this project. It's been a long time coming. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm happy for my... Uh, from my brother Alderman because he's been working and he's been truly truly frustrated with with uh, How long it has taken to even right. get to this point for some time So, you know, I, I fully support him in this development going forth and whatever we need to do to get it done. Thank, Thank you. you Yep, do you want to continue on or do you were there other points to cover in the presentation? Um, or that was it? No, I think I think we've covered okay. We've covered we've covered the presentation and Thank you for your time, and thank you again for having Alderman me. Alderman Williams. Yeah, so back to the union question. This, this, this activity is going into an area where I want to see women and people of color working on the project to reflect the community that is being built in, whether it's union, prevailing wage. That is not as important as it must reflect the people around it. Now, there's programs where you use some of the residents who live in that community to help become a part of the union. However you guys work it out, whether it's through Bone Mayor, you know, Bone Institute or 477, I'm, I don't care. I just want to see women and people of color on this project in Ward 3. Yeah, Thank actually, uh, this is an opportunity for a win-win because we hear it all the time that the workforce development needs to happen. We need the uh, unions to support the initiatives that we're trying to do and vice versa. And this is one project that can make it happen. So mm -hmm. hopefully everybody comes to the table with an open mind and an open heart and get it done. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Because it will pay prevailing wage and uh, that's what it's all about. And as everybody knows, uh, we're this council, thanks to this city council, we have a requirement that 51% uh, of any project with funds in there have to be a local workforce or at least that attainable goal. And uh, yeah, it'll, it, it will easily be done if everybody works together. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks Thank again. You. Any other questions or comments? Very good. Chair will entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the August 16th, 2022 oh, well. city council second. meeting and approve the minutes. The move and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first reading of ordinances into the record of the city council meeting. Move. Move. Second. second. The move and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda into the record of the city council meeting. Move. Second. Been moved and second. Uh, is there a motion to remove item 2022-366 from the consent agenda placed on the debate agenda for a public hearing? So move. Second. And this is to uh, vacate a right away. Been moved and second. Any discussion on the amendment? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. So moved. Move. Second. Move and moved second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Almost open. And the consent agenda passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Agenda number 2022-256, 2022-285, and 2022-353 remain tabled during committee. I'd ask uh, a motion to pull 2022-285 out of committee, please. Yeah, I make a motion that we bring to bring that motion out of committee, or that ordinance out of committee. For discussion. For discussion, please. I second the motion. We move and second. All, all, any questions on the motion? Yes. 
So, uh, Mr. Mayor, so this 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 uh, project it is a good project. It is a. Alderman Williams, well, we, we need to just any questions on the motion to bring oh, it out. So, I'm all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. So, 2022-285, uh, an ordinance authorizing execution of a contract with Enos Park Development, LLC, for purchase of the land and all improvements for 73 parcels of property located in Enos Park and listed on Exhibit A for an amount not to exceed $295,061. And we do have an amendment with that. Yes. But, uh, go ahead, Alderman Williams. Yes, yeah, so, so what I was speaking on is... Um, I've been informed that uh, there's there's a different source of funding, well, which did change my attitude toward this, you know, toward this project. I'm all about fairness and doing things, you know, that makes common sense up here. And um, I, I, I know that the media and some of the folks, you know, took it like I'm, you know, I'm picking on my own war. But I just wanted uh, people to understand that when I went three blocks east, Mayor, I, I had Pillsbury. And, and, and that God, if you could just see Pillsbury, you would understand what I'm saying. So I didn't want that competing money, but I'm understanding, and I would like somebody from Planning and Economic Development to come up and maybe explain this grant. Now that there's a grant available and they won't be using ARPA or TIF funds, it just, I had a, a change of heart about this now. You know, the funding's different. So that's why I wanted to at least bring it out and have it discussed tonight. Uh, since we have different funding, if they could come and share that. I think uh, Ravi Doshi's here from Economic Development. Good evening, Council members. Um, so, yes, uh, in 2019, I'm sorry, in 2021, uh, the city of Springfield received a strong communities program grant um, through IDA, the Illinois Housing Development Association, and the council had approved the $200,000 award for that grant. Um, the eligible uses of that grant um, are, that can be used for demolition, for property acquisition, and uh, for rehab mainly. And we've partnered with the Enos Park um, Neighborhood Association when this grant uh, was originally written to really target that area um, and uh, really assist uh, with rehabilitation, demolition, acquisition, in short, developing that area and using these funds. Uh, currently, we have uh, all $200,000 available for um, for use uh, for through this grant. And the proposal here is that we would use $200,000 to offset uh, the cost. Property acquisition is an eligible expense through this grant, and we are afforded $5,000 per parcel for property acquisition. So this would not... Um, use the ARPA dollars in that way or um, the TIF dollars in that way. The remaining uh, two out of the, the difference that is there, uh, we would look into CDBG funding um, to support um, that gap that's, that's remaining. Is there any other questions on that? Alderman McMinimum. Also, we have an amendment that reduces the spending level for Mm -hmm. down from 295,000 down to 255,000. Could you explain that? Yes, it was noted that the, um, the acquisition of these properties uh, would be less as some of them are on hold at the uh, county level. So the repurchase of those properties would actually be less than the proposed cost originally um, advised. Is that due to, if we move forward on this tonight, the next uh, the uh, and the city takes ownership, then the real estate taxes would not be, uh, become part of this reef, uh, this contractual agreement with Enos Park. In other words, that's the savings by doing this now. Real estate yes. taxes are avoided that become due. Correct, correct, Alderman. And that difference is roughly about $45,000. Alderman Desenza. Thank you. Um, so just to be clear, the people that wrote this grant initially or that went after this grant initially are coming back for the same grant? No. We've already been awarded this grant, so there would be no uh, rewrites uh, for this grant. Originally, we wanted to look at uh, perhaps versatility 
with the grant, you know, in terms of uh, demolition or rehabilitation. But in terms of uh, the position right now, we feel that this is the best because we are facing a d timeline as well with the grant itself. The grant expires in 2023, uh, March 19th, March 19, 2023. So, okay, so there's two hundred thousand dollars available. Correct. This is the first time I'm hearing about this grant. I don't know if anyone else has, but I know we are frequently called to ask about demolitions and property acquisition and things like that. And I mean, these could be used in other wards, not just all in this you know, pocket of the city. So that's a concern of mine because I get these questions all the time and I say, we don't have any money for that. And here we do have money for that. Yeah, actually this was uh, written on behalf of Venus Park. So that's where the funds that's were That's what I just said. That's what I just towards. asked and I was told no. Mm -hmm. so, Mr. Merritt, to clarify, you're saying that the grant was written um, with um, Venus Park in, in in mind that is correct that is correct it was it was kept in mind the I it, it uh, excuse my uh, lack of clarity on that issue uh, if you were asking if Enos Park would have to rewrite the grant or come back again that's not the case um, we had just come across the eligibility use of this and we had to confirm this with Ida that you know that we can actually use uh, that five thousand dollar and just use the two hundred thousand dollars for property acquisition completely Alderwoman Conley. Thank you. Um, okay, Alderwoman DeCenso touched on, on really the bulk of my other concerns, which, I'm sorry, I, I probably wasn't listening quite right, Rob. Rob when, when did you say we got this grant? Um, it was, uh, the effective date was March 19th of 2021. So over a year, a year and a half. But it was written with Enos Park in mind why wasn't why wasn't it used for Enos Park before now? We were attempting to uh, with uh, demolitions and um, re-improvements of the rehabs, but a lot of those weren't going through for a variety of reasons. So um, we felt at this time the best use of these grant dollars would be for Enos Park, and it would absolve the issue of funding source. And I'm sorry, I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but why couldn't they be used for demolitions of property? They could, it was just the timing. It takes about 10 to 14 days uh, for us to approve each parcel with Ida for their two-step verification process. So it was just a matter of uh, timing with the public work schedule of demolitions against the Ida schedule. So it was tough to kind of um, organize that, that timing to effectively use for demolitions. Okay. And, and I mean, again, and I, I, because we just got this amendment, I just found out about this tonight, um, that this was even an option for funding. Um, back up. Um, and I had talked to, and I, I, I see we have people from Minas Park here. Um, I had talked um, and asked if there would be um, a possibility of a cooperative agreement to maintain these lots. I, I will tell you, um, and I'm sorry, Daryl will say it this way, but I'm already, again, getting complaints about the tall grass that grows at the lot at Rickard and Lawrence in my ward. Um, it's, and I know we've gotten, we've gotten plenty of rain, we've gotten plenty of sun, grass will grow quickly. <coughs> I, I have some real concerns about the cost of maintaining these lots and, and making sure that, I mean, you're asking us to take on, you know, again, another requirement for the city to to keep an area that, that is trying to improve, to keep it looking good. Um, has there been any development, do you know, on that? On, on, and I, you might not be the right person to ask, yeah. someone from Public Works or Enos Park. Um, has there been any conversations about doing some sort of a cooperative agreement or something to make sure that these lots are also maintained without taking maintenance away from other lots in the, in the city? Because I hear about Rickard and Lawrence on a regular basis, and it, it it's already tall again. It's not 10 inches everywhere, but it's getting there. So can someone answer that? I don't know if it's public works or. <coughs> Hi. Hey, Michelle. Me again. Um, 
so yes, we've, we've said all along that we are open to that. If that is one of the conditions that you or any of the other council members want to place on it, we are certainly open to an amendment on the ordinance. I mean, regardless of whether there's a formal agreement in place, I can tell you that we will absolutely help main, maintain the lots because of course, in addition to just mowing, there's also, you know, clearing brush and other things that need to occur and, and it's our neighborhood and we want it to look good. And just like we do a spring and a fall cleanup of the alleys, every year, you know, that's just something we do as volunteers because we live there and, and it's our neighborhood. Um, but to answer your question more specifically, yes, we did have a conversation with Director Bottom. I didn't see him here tonight, but we did talk to him a while. Oh, I'm sorry, I overlooked you. Um, you I did talk pretty well. We did have a conversation with him a while back uh, about that as well, and, and certainly I'll defer to him if he wants to speak to any more formalized uh, actually, agreement. Director, but, but yeah, we're, we're open to whatever is the will of the council. Thank you. Yeah, we did have a brief conversation about that and they said that they would help out. However, with that being said, we are still spread fairly thin and we would need some additional money in order to maintain the lots. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Alderman Redpath. What is the original amount of money that we gave Venus Park to do this project back in the old days or whenever this first came around? Anybody? Hello. They received uh, some funds to demo properties, I think, uh, as under a previous administration. I think it was about 250000 a year, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, all of them purchased might be able to speak to it or Michelle. But what they've done is, you know, that's why they have 73 lots without houses. So if you just multiply it out, I'd ask Daryl Harris to come up and let us know what the average cost for a demo is. It has to be right. But Ten thousand dollars, so that's seven hundred thousand dollars. So two hundred fifty thousand a year for how many years, Mayor? I think just four or somewhere around there. Yep. Thank you. And so that's maintaining the properties. Uh, they've done some rehab of the projects, sold those houses whenever possible. Uh, when we were talking about the, uh, someone brought it up. Why weren't the funds uh, uh, spent on the uh, Strong Communities grant? Part of that was for potential duplex that uh, they're working towards but uh, they'd rather forego that and purchase the properties. And not, let's not lose sight because uh, the properties are in the medical area. It's the medical community. Ed Curtis, you know, everybody talks about Ed Curtis. He, uh, he was supportive of this initiative because he knows the importance of the medical community and what it means to have a mass amount of properties in the area instead of letting go back for the tax sale. So why are we bringing it up tonight? The tax sale is, I believe, Thursday. That's when we have to make a decision one way or the other. Uh, otherwise, it does go back 37 properties or 33, whatever the number is. So half of them will go back to whatever. And I understand everybody's concerned about cutting grass, but uh, Daryl can tell you, okay. Nate can tell you, the treasurer can tell you, there's a lot of vacant properties that people purchase for investment. And Enos Park is right for investment. So what people from outside this Springfield area They'll buy it, they'll be in sight unseen, they'll purchase the property, and they'll sit on it. And so we end up cutting the grass, siding them. Sometimes we'll get collections, sometimes we don't. But this is a way for us to kind of control the destiny and actually improve what's happened in Enos Park. And we've had this very discussion, I think it was uh, last council meeting, and we, we wanted to take the vote then. But I know council members said, no, we need to work through this. You had Ryan McCready of the SSGA up here supporting the project, DSI supporting the project, and it, it seemed like a large plurality supporting the project, but everybody said, let's wait and identify the sources. So I, uh, my hat's off to OPED. They came up with a potential source, and uh, that was this week, so that's why we're bringing it forward to do the right thing and ask for the council's consideration to amend it uh, because the clock's ticking and we want to move forward with development uh, as much as possible. Alderwoman Purchase. So um, Alderwoman Conley just said she wanted to know if they would help with maintaining the properties, but if they vote no, that Public Works has to maintain the properties, correct? They, it won't be no partnering if there's not a vote towards it. So they would have to do that, right? They would have to yeah, become a, lots. It'd become the city's property. Similar to Rickard Road, is that the fire station's location? 
Yep, similar to that one. So, but we your acts and fight, but your acts and kind of, if you was voting, if you thought about voting yes, would Enos Park partner so we wouldn't have to deal with the situation that you're talking about on Ricker Road? I mean, I would assume, I, I'm sorry, Mary. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. All the I, I would assume that some of those properties get bought, then we have the new owners would be responsible for maintaining them. I mean, if it goes to a, so, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's, it's not like either we give money and maintain it or we don't give money and still maintain it. I think there, there's a mix in there, but yeah, I am interested in that. And I, I, and I, again, I appreciate how much Enos Park has done for the neighborhood and how much volunteer work they do. I just, it was a conversation we'd had and I didn't, hadn't closed that loop yet, so. Okay, yeah, and I'm strongly encouraging everyone to think about this. We just had a, um, press conference last week and we brought Illinois State University nursing program here and they're going in on North Grand in the shop and say and the students the ideal is to have development over there because now you have students from uh, Bloomington Illinois come in here and also students who would like to stay here and enter that nursing program so there's a lot of opportunity going on right now for that development that we didn't have before and I think that's why last week we had Ryan McCready and them here so that they could talk about it. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess the question I have is, all right, what's we buy these lots, what's our plan? Are they just going to sit vacant? They, it took them, they've had them for 12 years or something like that. They haven't been able to sell them. Um, you know, their master plan goes out the door once we get them because we got to get rid of them. Um, because, number one, we're not getting any property, property taxes off of this. You know, we, we talk about the whole residency and everything. And with residency, the thing was getting people in. They pay the, the, the property taxes. Well, every, every one that the city takes over, you're just blowing that, you know, blowing that to, to smithereens because we're, not, we're losing property tax on it. I, I want to know what the plan is because if we're just going to buy them and sit on them, that's ridiculous that that you know but we've got to do something to where we can get this sold and and get them back on the tax rolls this is a nice area over there and and I, I I agree with you it's in the it's in the medical district but they've had them for 12 years and haven't had any luck it doesn't make us and we're not in the real estate business they are you know, we've got enough lots that we're trying, we need to get rid of, and we can't, we, we seem to not be doing a great job of, of getting those off the books. So I guess my question is, going forward, what's our plan on these if we end up taking them? Why? Well, I, uh, all the women purchase, and um, I'll ask uh, Kayla Graven to come forward with DSI, talking about the plan that we're putting in place. Uh, then I'd ask uh, Saeed, uh, yeah, Saeed to come forward and, uh, She's helping with the Harvard Fellow Program, you know, the whole block redevelopment. So she can bring her expertise. Uh, she's an urban planner. She's an architect. So uh, she can give her initial insight. She's only been here about a month, but she uh, brought a, a lot of knowledge with her and has a uh, wide open perspective of what can happen. I want to let them go first. No, you can go ahead. Well, you, I, you can I speak just, from the historic perspective. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Ralph, that from the time I've been sitting up here, we've had three different developers come to us with Michelle in the room too. There's multiple um, opportunities going on. I can't speak for what has happened before me with developers, but I've been sitting at the table and now we were just waiting for the nursing program to come here and about almost a half a block could be built up for these resident students. Same thing at the beginning of Carpenter coming into Enos Park. There's another, another developer that owns a large portion of the properties over there that wants to turn around and rebuild and do the same thing. So now you got almost three blocks taken up. So there is good movement. And you know me, I'm like a net at a barbecue. I'm always asking questions, asking for follow-ups, continuing to say where are we at and how can we make this work. So I think that's the movement now, but I do understand frustration because you've been up here for a while and haven't seen continuing movement going on. So that's just what I wanted to say from my perspective. Well, Kayla, you want to come up and speak to the... Uh planning that's happening right now and then I I'll put Saeed Joshi only if she wants to come up and share her <laughs> insights that's her discretion 
Kayla Graven, Executive Director of Downtown Springfield, Inc. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, yeah, so right now we're going through a master plan that encompasses the medical district and the downtown area. This is a 12-month plan that we're going to be going through, and there is multiple funding partners as part of this. It is the Growth Alliance, um, the Community Foundation, and also the city. In part, Horos Man has also contributed some money towards this effort. Um, we just started this effort on the 30th of August and 31st. They just came to town for the beginning part and we did walk this area with the consultants um, just a FYI the consultants are House of Levine from Chicago and they're a very reputable um, planning firm that we're going with and um, so that the medical district does encompass the Enos Park area as well is there any other questions people might have for me in regards to that yes Alderman Gregory did you want to speak now uh, yes, I just had a few questions. So we talk about a, a master plan. I, I know um, we have spoken on that. So has has anybody seen the master plan as far as so maybe it will give us a better visual? So we don't have a master plan yet. We're in the process of doing it. So it's a 12-month-long um, process that we go through, and we're on day three. Well, what about the old one? That, that the old one? Part? There's never been a master oh, no. plan for downtown oh. specifically. There has been one for the medical district, and there's been a separate one for Enos Park. And okay. Michelle, I believe, could speak on yeah, that that's, part. Yeah, that's the one I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm aiming at. Thank you, Ms. Kayla. Ms. Ms. Michelle, is there is there, is there a master plan that, that maybe we, we could get forwarded to sort of show what the thought is on some of these lots and yes and absolutely so the Enos Park master plan was completed in 2011 that's actually when we created the land bank and started acquiring properties because that's what the consultants recommended that we gain control and be able to attract um, different types of larger development um, I believe the master plan is on our website but I can definitely email it to the council okay. members as well um, what Kayla is referring to is a separate planning effort to better tie together the downtown and the medical district and of course Enos Park is completely within the boundaries of the medical district so how you know we have a lot of uh, relationship with with downtown um, you know between the new YMCA and the medical facilities we've always worked closely with DSI and this planning effort is to look at more cohesive efforts there between downtown and the med district which of course also <coughs> takes in Enos Park okay thank you um, I, I just want to say you know this, this is a tough one, and, and, and uh, you know, I've said from the get-go, I, I really am, am, am not a fan of how this is all playing out, and I, I uh, you know, I, I hollered about finding a different fund. Um, the mayor and his economic team have done that, so I'm inclined to support the alderman if that's what he wants to do um, on it. But I, I will say that, that, you know, going forth, you know, the, the grass is a concern. Um, uh, director Bottom, we have spoken about our lots. And, you know, I consider a few things, right? Lots in my ward, people own them, they don't cut them, they're in Florida. I don't want that, I don't want that to happen in your community. And, and, and you know, taking my own personal feelings out and stuff and, and thinking about the people of the community because I've spoken to them in passing um, is, is my main goal. Um, but that is a complex problem, and, 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 and we definitely need to do it. Um, I remember before we, we talked about having residents on city property and, and doing stuff, and there's, you know, I believe there's probably some type of insurance worries or in union issues that we need to think about as well. Um, if somebody gets hurt on there, then, then we're, we're, we're responsible as well. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, if we're going to go forward and we're going to acquire these lots, then we need to look at our budget and we need to make sure that, that we have enough money in them to cut them and enough contracts to cut them um, as they need to be cut. Um, you know, I know out on Rickard Road and um, we, we talked about the grass over there, but I see this in my community all day. Taller than me, I'm about 5'10", almost 6 foot when I'm dreaming. But, um you know, so so I, I understand it, and you know I'm going to support it, so we can keep some control of it, and, and not have reckless, you know, just anybody buying them up, and then we have a bigger problem than what we have now. I, I appreciate that, Alderman, and again, we're we're happy to help with the lots, whether it's you know mowing, clearing brush, whatever, as long as there's no issues on the city's end as far as liability, labor, whatever. Um, just like we help out with the alleys and the cleanups and things like that, we'll we'll do whatever we can do to be helpful. I get it. Trust me. Alderman McMinimum. Um, I'd just like to um, make a few comments regarding what you described there, Kayla Graven. You, you described that there's a new planning process for downtown Springfield, Inc., and the medical district, and the kickoff meeting was last uh, August, uh, last week. 
August 31 at 8 a.m. at the library. Yep. And uh, so I attended that meeting, and there was a mass amount of interest. Um, it was very encouraging. It was standing room only in the, what's the room called at the library that we had? Carnegie there? Hall. Say again. Carnegie Hall. Car 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 Carnegie. Carnegie Room. I love you. Okay. Yep. I, you know, I love New York City sometimes. <laughs> the uh, library staff was bringing in more chairs. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of momentum there. Ryan McCready was there. Um, um, Mike Murphy, the Chamber of Commerce, was there. Um, they asked, you know, how many own businesses or live in the area. All the hands went up. And there's a lot of um, participation and uh, grassroots uh, involvement. So. I think what we're hearing tonight is that um, I know some of the concern in the past was don't use TIF money for this ordinance. So we've got a different funding source. And um, we're kind of trying to get this through because the cost to the city to purchase will go up by uh, roughly, what, what is it, forty or $50,000 if we don't do it tonight. So uh, um, I think we've got a pretty good opportunity here and to show encouragement to Enos Park. And I know. Um, Enos Park Development LLC is for this, but I think what we're picking up is the neighborhood is for this, and some really significant people are for this, like um, Ted Curtis from the hospital. Um, Ted. Hey, Ted. Curtis. Ted. Sorry, I said it again wrong, but um, so I, I hope um, if, if Alder Williams, if you don't want to make a motion to put it on debate, um, you know, I'd be prepared. You to. know, I like to create a record. It's going on debate if we. Can. Well, that concludes my comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Alderwoman Conley. Um, thank you. So, a um, couple of things. Um, first of all, were there geographic limits to how that uh, grant could be used? Like, was the grant written to be used within the boundaries of the Enos Park neighborhood, or Michelle? Sure, I can speak to that. And I, and I did want to clarify just one thing on the, the dates. I know that uh, predates Ravi's employment with the city, I think, but it might have been a little confusing. We started working with the city on the grant back in 2019 uh, when Donna was originally hired as a, a grant writer. And so we worked with her on the, the language for the grant application. And, and yes, the intention was specific to Enos Park. The grant, um, the clock actually started ticking January of this year, so we haven't really been sitting on the grant all this long. Um, by the time the grant was awarded, and I think Alderman Williams, you referenced earlier, you know, Ida is a great funding source, but sometimes they're a little slow about doing things. There's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross and things like that. So just it, it took a long time from when we were initially informed that the grant was being awarded until they gave us the go ahead to start using it. And then we had been working with Ravi and Donna and Public Works on kind of a wish list of properties to target for acquisition, demolition, renovation. You know, we still have a number of blighted properties in the neighborhood and things like that. And so kind of putting together a hit list, but none of that money has been spent yet as the bottom line. January 1st was when Ida gave the green light um, but just because of all the other behind the scenes things, none of that, none of that money has actually been spent. So then economic development was able to contact Ida and find out that this would be an allowable expense. You know, several of the aldermen had asked about, um, other funding sources. So since we already had this money in hand, that seemed like an ideal, an ideal option. So, and I guess, and thank you for that. I, I appreciate that kind of clarifying. It makes it, although still we knew in January we had this money. Um, which is, and that's not on you, Michelle, that's, it, that's just me expressing frustration that we come in tonight for something that really is a big impact to a significant part of our, our city um, and just find out about it this late. Um, but my question was, are there geographic boundaries? Like, it, was this money written specifically to be spent within the boundaries of Enos Park Neighborhood Association? I, I know it was written with Enos Park in mind, but you know what I mean? Was, it, was the area named in the grant? Um, that I, I can't answer. It's been a couple years now since we worked with Donna on writing the grant, so I no longer recall the specifics of it, but I can tell you that was the intention because we were involved early on in, as I said, in the application process. And I will tell you, having using these grant funds um, is a little bit easier for me. Um, I, I've really struggled with this with this one. We've, we've talked about it, and you've been in here, and I, and I appreciate you coming in. And, I appreciate all the years of work that you've done to advocate for, for Enos Park. Um, I, I used to live in, in Lincoln Park neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know 
again, that was the whole point of the ordinance that for external rehab. One blighted home can drag down a neighborhood, and what you're doing is trying to, one at a time, really improve your neighborhood, and, and I appreciate that. So the funding does help a little bit, um, and maybe someone from op-ed could answer the question about the geographic limitations to the, to the funding. Uh, do we have anyone who, from the medical district, who was here to speak to this ordinance? Last week. Mm -hmm. Not today, because we didn't know it was coming out. But last week we had everybody here. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Redpath. I believe that tax sales November 4th. I don't, it's not coming up right now. It's November 4th. Is that correct? Um, I don't know the exact date for the tax sale. Um, I spoke with Corporation Council earlier today, and he had indicated that I believe this week is the deadline to notify the county okay. so that the properties are, you know, okay, they have I, to prepare the booklet or whatever, the list of properties, and Corporation Council had indicated that, that makes this week sense. was the I, deadline they, to it, notify the county. The, the sale itself is November 4th, but if, if the notification date's right, there. Right, they okay. have to advertise it however many days in advance and put up the signs and that sort of thing. Thank so. you. Alderman Hanauer. Thanks. I'm sorry for speaking again, but uh, you know I, I struggled with this as well, and I think that that I, I having it as a grant that was made towards towards Enos Park does does make it a little easier. However, I'm willing to support this, but I want to make sure that we have quarterly reports that tells us what's going on with this land, and we need to start doing that for all our properties. What, what's been offered, why hasn't it been sold, and, and you know, what we need to continue to do this because we, we got to get rid of our, this property. We're not, we're not in the real estate business. We're just not. And like I said, I'm willing to support this, but I want to I guarantee that we're going to have uh, probably by first, first meeting in January that we, got our, we, we know what's going on you know what's been done With that um, because I think that if it's if it's got that much uh, interest I would have thought that they would have sold them already and uh, I'm I, I don't want to get stuck with these things and it's not going to be a case where they they have a master plan but we got to sell the lots and it may not fit in their master plan what we what who, what someone does but we got to sell the lots so I'm willing to support it if we if we can get a report in probably first first council meeting in January so we know what's going on. Sure will. Is that from Mayor? Is that from Ravi or is that from Michelle when Ralph is That'd asking? Be the from Ravi or and from, from Amanda Long with okay. on on right. what's been sold and you know, but we got to get an RFP to get him out. Alderman Donlin. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. You know I've had very little time to look at this proposed amendment since it was passed out this evening, but I do appreciate the conversation amongst us all at the Horseshoe this evening about about this issue. You know, one of the things that I struggled with, actually it wasn't much of a struggle, the reason I was against this uh, as originally proposed is because the city clearly paid for, used, utilized tax increment financing money to acquire properties. and We were being asked to use tax increment financing money and other city money to uh, that could be used for development anywhere um, to acquire the property again. That just didn't fit, smell right, whatever you want to say. And uh, this is a, I, Alderwoman Conley, I appreciate your question about the intent of the $200,000 grant because that is absolutely of relevance to essentially what is happening is if the Enos Park is for this, they're essentially... Uh, I'll just say it this way, hurting themselves by wanting to utilize the funds that were going to be used to, I assume, acquire other properties and demo properties that needed to be demolished uh, for this to basically wipe the slate clean and give the city ownership. The thing I like, the thing I've liked about this whole thing, I'm just sorry about the, the uh, stream of consciousness here, but the thing mm -hmm. I've liked about this whole thing is at least it would give the city control finally. You have control of the property. I agree with you, Alderman Hanauer. We don't, we're not a, the city's not, doesn't have a great track record of being in the development business. Uh, that we obviously, it's in everyone's best interest to get these in private hands, these properties in private hands for development. 
Um, I quite frankly haven't yet made up my mind what I'm going to do, but I, I appreciate the conversation. Um, I definitely would have been a, uh, opposed as originally uh, submitted, utilizing TIF funds twice. That just isn't right. Um, anyway, I guess we'll see how the conversation goes the rest of the rest of the night. Thank you for listening. Alderman Williams. Yeah, if there's no other discussion, I'd like to uh, make a motion to uh, put this on debate as amended. I, I have one yeah. more comment. Alderman Purchase. Yes, um, Michelle, just for clarification, when you went for the grant, was that something you approached the city about and Donna helped you out with it or did Donna approach you about the grant? Donna approached us and made us aware that this grant was available but thought that Enos Park would be an excellent candidate. I believe actually one of the requirements for the grant was that the area had to have a master plan. Okay. And because we are an area of the city that already had a master plan, you know, you get points when you apply to Ida you get points for different things, and we checked a lot of those boxes, and we also met their criteria of having a master plan. So that was one of the reasons that she felt we would qualify. And to Alderman Donnellan's point, um, yes, we, we absolutely, I mean, Robbie's got a spreadsheet in his office, I'm sure, that we've been working on that shows what we were intending to do with that $200,000 and other properties that we were targeting for renovation and demolition and various things. but. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's much more important in our mind to try to keep these properties together and keep that opportunity for large-scale development. And uh, it seemed like, you know, based on our previous conversations with the council members, that there would be a, a, a greater comfort level using a funding source other than TIF. So that's why, you know, Robbie checked to make sure that it would be an eligible expense, and Ida gave the okay, and we decided to, to try to proceed with this. Thank you. So uh, there's a motion. Do you want to go over the amendment, sorry, Council? Sorry, Mayor. Oh, sorry, Alderman Conley. Uh, so, Michelle, because you just said something that um, kind of triggered another thought for me. The fact that Enos Park has a master plan was part of the actual grant application. That is it, my recollection. Again, this has been a couple years ago now, but I, I know it was the city that approached us, but when we looked over the criteria for the grant, you know, I, I mean, it's very time-consuming to apply for these grants, right? So yes. you don't want to waste your time and energy if it's a long shot. But when we sat down with Donna and we looked at the criteria to qualify for the grant and, you know, what we knew we would get points for, it seemed like we were a pretty strong candidate. And as I recall... And part of that was that master plan. And as I concept. recall, having a master plan was one of the criteria in uh, <laughs> applying for the grant. I, and I'm sorry, because I actually did ask a question. I think maybe someone from Op-Ed could come up. Um, Do we know if there are geographical limits? And, and Ravi, if you've been, obviously I'm sure you've been like doing reporting on this grant and, and, and dealing with all of the back and forth and getting it implemented. Do you, re, do you know if there is an actual geographic boundaries to where these funds can be used? I do not recall that, that there was any geographic limitations that were set. Um, so long as Ida would approve our, our parcels that we submit to them. Okay, and then how do we have this approval from Ida? Is this, is this a written approval, or did you, just, did you talk to, like, a grant manager there? Yeah, I talked to um, Bill Ehrmeyer. He is their uh, our liaison for this particular grant on the Strong okay. Communities Program, and I actually called him um, to ask about this specifically, if this would be an eligible um, expense if we would submit all these uh, parcels in one shot. Okay, because I, I will say I, I am willing to support this ordinance if, if with this amendment, but only with that funding. So if at some later point that funding falls through, I think it needs to be very, at least for me, it needs to be very clear that I agree with Alderman Donnellan. I would absolutely not support TIF funds for this, project, for this project. So if Ida comes back later when you submit things and they say, oh, no, we've changed our mind, you actually can't do this, um, that's, I, I have a concern about that. And, and I, I hope... Um, it would have been nice to have had it in writing that this was okay, but but if yeah, we can we can definitely get that as well. Um, but I wanted to clarify that you know right off the bat with Ida, you know that if we move forward down this, that uh, the expectation would be that we would submit all these parcels at one time. Okay, and, okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, uh, corporate counsel. Wait. Well, oh, sorry. All the woman Desenzo. Sorry. Um, right. So this only covers two hundred thousand dollars of it. Where's the other fifty-five? Two twenty-five. Two twenty-five. This covers the grant covers two hundred twenty-five. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. Okay. So, but there's 
This is for 200. CBG. Okay. Yes. CBG. CBG would cover the difference in the cap. Oh. Yes, all the woman comment. Okay, sorry, all the woman did sense of brought something up. So um, the CDBG funds would be used for per properties that were purchasing that with the intent for those to be rehabbed for low income residents? That is, that is correct. That is okay. correct. And, and that's a fairly standard, and that's part of our whole plan and, and everything that we've right. given. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before Corporation Council goes over the amendment? Just uh, very briefly, first, um, the most, the original motion was to place it for discussion, so the motion would be proper to place it on the de debate agenda, so a proper vote could be taken in adoption of the ordinance uh, in the amendment. The amendment provides for the reduction from the uh, 295 to 255, also specifies the funding sources that have been talked about, 200000 with the uh, IHDA funds for Strong Community Program grant funds, and then also CDBG for the remaining. And the reason for the reduction basically is that we're getting the benefit of having gone through the tax sale without actually having to wait or go through the tax sale. And the trustee has routinely through the years uh, worked with the, uh, when the, with the city when the city's asked to acquire properties. It just so happens that Thursday's the deadline where they have to do, do the publications and everything. Once that happens, then it has to go through the court process with the uh, bidding process and so on. Uh, the, just very briefly on the issue, uh, just by way of information, uh, Mayor, you may recall this had come up once before. The city actually does maintain all of the trustee properties because the county or the trustee has no funds, so we actually already take care of literally, I think it's uh, in excess of 200 properties that the tax trustee owns that they have no resource to mow or take care of. So whether it ends up in a tax sale with the trustee taking title, if there's no bid, the trustee takes title, uh, then they have no resources anyway, so we'd be end up having to take care of them irrespective of that. So the amendment simply reduces the price and then uh, specifies the uh, source of funds as indicated. Motion on the amendment. Motion to, to, for debate. Motion for debate. And, and that way that allows you to take action if you, yep. you know, choose to you do it. Any discussion on debate? I thought I did it. All, um, all in favor of debate? Aye. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. Motion on the amendment? So move. Second. Good move and second. Discussion on the amendment? All in favor of the ordinance as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote, vote on the no. Amendment no. First. Oh, amendment, no. First. No. amendment first. Sorry, I was Voice jumping vote. ahead. Amendment All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Uh, motion on the item as amended. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Thank you. And the ordinance passes as amended. Nine voting yes, one voting no. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is 2022-366, an ordinance vacating the right of way known as Lynx View Court to Prime Acquisitions, LLC, to allow development of the adjoining property. The chair will entertain a motion to recess the regular meeting of the city council to hold a public hearing regarding the vacation of the right of way. So moved. Moved. Good move. Good move. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Public hearing is now open. Does anybody wish to address the City Council regarding the vacation of the right-of-way? Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene the regular City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-366 on final passage. So, so moved. moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? <clears throat> All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes seven voting yes, none voting no. Or, I'm sorry, eight voting yes, none voting no. Chair will entertain a motion to suspend the rules and place on first reading agenda number 2022-398, an ordinance authorizing a contract with Dwayne Johnson for the purchase of real estate located at 
1334 East North Grand Avenue in the amount of $40,000 and closing cost in the amount of $1,500 and for a total amount not to exceed $41,500 relating to the Springfield Rail Improvement Project usable segment 6A for the Office of Public Works. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. The moved second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to spend the rules in place on first reading agenda number 2022-399, an ordinance authorizing relocation expenses for the acquisition of property occupying parcel SR-0037-1334 East North Grand Avenue in the amount of $3,630 relating to usable segment 6A of the Springfield Rail Improvements Project for the Office of Public Works. So moved. Second. The moved second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to suspend the rules in place on first reading agenda number 2022-400, an ordinance authorizing relocation expenses for the acquisition of property lo occupying parcel SR-0027-1631 East North Grand Avenue in the amount of $26,582.60 relating to usable segment 6A of the Springfield Rail Improvements Project for the Office of Public Work. A point of order, Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we treat this one and the others with an omnibus vote to so put them back. Second. Been moved moving second. Any discussion? And this is ominous vote for the next one, you're saying? Uh, for all of them through. Oh, all. for all of them. Okay. For all, four. for all the remaining uh, ordinances. For an ominous vote, uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chairman, take motion to spend. Oh, I'm sorry. Rules uh, first reading agenda number 2022 401. Ordinance authorizing relocation expenses for the acquisition of property occupying parcel SR 0025 1613. 1615 East North Grand Avenue, the amount of $160,160 relating to usable segment 6A of the Springfield Rail Improvements Project for the Office of Public Works. Ordinance authorize, number 2022-402, authorizing a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $75,000 from unappropriated fund balance to accommodate the purchase of grave markers for Oak Ridge Cemetery to reimburse transferred funds from expense line 1606 so software support fees for the Office of Public Works. Agenda number 2022-403, an ordinance amending ordinance 29 or 299-07-22 by continuing to provide financial assistance on a matching basis of 50-50 matching <laughs> basis except those applicants who earn 80% or less of the median income, family income as established under HUD guidelines, financial assistance would be provided on a 10% to 20% matching basis for the exterior rehabilitation program utilizing Far East Side tax increment finance funds for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. Then agenda number 2022-404, an ordinance authorizing supplemental appropriation in the amount of $120,000 for firefighter personnel gear for the Springfield Fire Department. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion second. to put on first reading. Moved and second. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Is there any unfinished business come before the City Council? Yes. All of them purchase? Um, everyone um, received an email from um, the attorney for bus bomb there has been some situations occurring and I just wanted to be clear that I have been working with both entities and will be bringing an amendment forward to address this and just wanted to clear the air because it came off as if I hadn't been talking to anyone so um, just thank you for letting me say that and be looking for the amendment too any other unfinished business yes sir Alder so, Williams uh, you know, earlier, when, when we deal with um, these properties, you know, these tax properties from the trustee, and they don't have money uh, to maintain, uh, it's time to do something about that. I have several in my ward that are either county properties or trustee properties or township properties, you know, the, and then I'm on Duro and Public Works to get them cut, get them cut, or, you know, get them in there, and they've already stretched what are legitimate 
property. So I've been on this council almost two years and we continually bring this up, but we never take action. I don't know if it has to be agreement between the county and the city, but we really do need to know how many of properties these are and how often they're cut and, and can we get something for them? I mean, just to say the county, you know, gets these properties and then they don't maintain them and our neighbors are calling us continuously saying that needs to be cut, you know, and then we don't have an owner to go to because it's listed as trustee, you know, same county trustee. So I, I just think, Mayor, it's time to try to put something on the books I agree. to come up with a way to maintain those lots to where we're getting some type of a monetary or uh, some kind of agreement with them so that we're not just doing it for free. Because when Daryl tells me, well, we got our own city lots that we're working on, on in your war, that before we can get to that, now it's even higher. And it looks like, you know, the average citizen can't tell the difference. They just know it's on the block or it's around the corner and it's just there and the city ain't doing their job. And that's not really true. A lot of times we don't have the control mechanism to, to get it cut or to get it done right away anyway. So, yeah, we'll take a look at uh, what the options are. Um, aside from uh, unless Corporation Council wants to weigh in right now. But uh, you know, the other one is just uh, putting more resources to help public works uh, make that cut. The other, normally what we would do is put a lien on the property, but since it's going to uh, tax sell anyway, it kind of <laughs> defeats that purpose. So we'll do some uh, research and see what we can come up with. Appreciate it. Just, just very briefly, I mean, this discussion, there has been a discussion with the county, uh, with the trustee, and I think their position is that the state law, which, you know, this is all operates under state law uh, regarding tax sales, so there's a process they go through. But they are the, in effect, almost the, um, the legal owner, but not responsible. So um, this has been talked with, uh, I think, on more than one occasion, but they do not feel that they have really an obligation, that the mechanism, the collection mechanism that they go through, you know, through the tax sale process, they are not responsible for either ordinance violations or for the mowing or cleanup. And you may recall, Mayor, we had actually, I think, talked to uh, the chairman and also uh, uh, Brian. And I think uh, their view is that they have a legal duty through that state law, but they don't have a responsibility to reimburse or pay the cost for the uh, cleanup or mowing. So it would probably require a change to the state law that would allow some kind of a uh, funding source to pay it. Otherwise, uh, it's ended up being the responsibility of the city by virtue of the fact that you get complaints and uh, so on. But their view is they don't have the resources and the trustee does not have the authority to hire contractors. They don't have money to pay it. Mr. Mayor, I'd like yes, to Yes, Alderman McMinimum. So I agree with Alderman Williams that uh, we need to give attention to this problem. And Mr. Mayor, I think you made a good point that uh, we have to devote more resources to public work so they can get the job done. And this is just not on one part of the town because right. we've got, I get complaints about, um, I wasn't going to bring this up, about, you know, the right of way along, uh, for example, Chatham Road south of, uh, south of Wabash or Old Jacksonville Road, um, where our crews can only get out there, let's say, every two or three weeks. And by then, by that time, you know, it, it's way beyond the violation height. And uh, so we need to give more resources to public works and add uh, their, their crews if needed because we, got, we want pride in our neighborhood. And these roads are um, oftentimes the gateways to our neighborhoods. And even if they're not, we want the neighbors to feel like the city is responding to their complaints yes. and that we care and that uh, we want to set a right standard for everybody. And so... Um, is Mr. McCarty here or, or Public Works, when we get ready for budget time, let's beef up our, uh, our mowing crews uh, or however we do it. I know we contract some of that work out also, but we got to beef it up. For the, we're the capital city. We want pride wherever the tourists go or the visitors go. So let's, let's make it an effort. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'll just say that. So, so it's also fly dumping. Mm. You know, they, they, they fly dump on those properties, and then we're stuck. 
and it looks like the city's not responding to that couch or that refrigerator or whatever the situation is, you know, I always start off using the system and trying to identify the owner and do all this. But so between the fly dumping and the mowing, it can make us look bad. So I'm hoping that we really can, um, corporate counsel, come up with some kind of way, even if we have to start with Senator Turner and try to get it changed, like like you're explaining, you know. And uh, kudos to the police department. I think they actually caught a fly dumper using the LPRs. Hey, so hey, it's hey, a hey, matter hey, of reporting hey, it. Hey, oh, my goodness. If they know uh, soon enough, they can check the camera system and identify if they did it by vehicle, who did it. So we should have people report fly dumping as quickly as possible. Right. Yeah. yeah. No doubt. Um, any other old business? Is there a, a new business? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yep, Alderman Gregory. I would just, um, I I was going through my emails and I and I did see that we did um, receive our Levitt uh, AMP grant continuation for the next three years, which is really big for our city. Um, you know, and and I'm I'm happy about that. And I just, you know, uh, along with you know some potential development down on the Y block, hopefully we can see this for you know even when I'm an old man, stay in our city. So I appreciate it. Yeah, we'd like to. Kayla to come forward and uh, say a few words about that because yeah. it's her hard work that helped make it happen. So we really appreciate it, Kayla. Thank you, Kayla. I almost didn't come tonight, so <laughs> <laughs> impromptu, yes. So we did receive the grant for the um, North Mansion block area, the Y block, um, for the next three years. So it's not going away anytime soon. And we've increased our match to from $25,000 to $30,000 each right. year. So it'll be really exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Good work. Good work. We love it. Any other new business? Oh, we do have uh, some people signed up. First is uh, Ruby Davis. If you'd come up and state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. <clears throat> As a reminder, if uh, whoever addresses the council, if they address the comments to the chair, uh, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Ruby Davis, and I am just asking that the approval for my liquor license be revisited. I have satisfied all the requirements and paid all the fees that's associated with the request. This liquor license will allow me to expand my current business model by allowing families to celebrate the loss of their loved ones to experience a complete one-stop shop for their event. By expanding my business, I will be able to create more jobs. By creating jobs, it will increase the flow of dollars and both taxes and people's ability to put those dollars back into society. In addition, people will have the opportunity to gather at a facility that is legal and regulated for the activity. Also, the business will not be for walk-up sales. I repeat, it will not be providing any type of walk-up sales. We just want to be able to have the liquor license to become a full service entity. I also am asking to allow me time to get a petition for the Pioneer Park Association area. Also, I do understand that there's a lot of what ifs, what if this happens, what if this happens. But what if it goes well? Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Margaret Taylor. Come up and state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. Good evening. Good evening. Again, my name is Margaret Campbell Taylor and I'm the part owner of MJ's Fish and Chicken Express. Uh, to the mayor and the uh, audience, I did just some additional research regarding the license for Ruby. Dr. Davis, I'm sorry. And I just gathered it was two voices. It was Ottoman Gregory voice and the voice of the president of the Pioneer Park Association. So that let me know there wasn't everybody that is in that area. As Dr. Davis stated, 
Our next step is to get petitions to, to, for the people to say whether or not they want her to have her license, uh, liquor license. As we all know that a community business, as I stated uh, previously, that a community business uh, in a neighborhood such as Ottoman, such as War II, it would bring a large tax revenue there, as well as Dr. Davis said, create jobs. I can assure you, I know Dr. Davis very well. We have, uh, we go to the same church, but not only that, we are best friends. And I can assure you that her establishment would not be like the other establishments in War II with liquor license that we see in ongoing trouble. So like she stated, just give us a couple of um, weeks. Uh, we can put the petition out there. Um, and so we can see what the people in the community want for her. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Mary Francis. Question. Mr. Yeah, question. Oh, sorry, Alderman Gregory. Point of information. So, Mr. Mr. Zarko, um, if if I want to withdraw this, um, I've I've already you know given my my stance on this. If I want to withdraw this next week, um, do do we have that option, or does the mayor have to do it since it's his ordinance? Well, <clears throat> this is uh, this is presented uh, in the process of an application for a license. So. The mayor being the liquor commissioner, that's why uh, his name is on there because it goes through the normal process. Uh, I think you would defer to the uh, to the mayor on that. But there may be, I think, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about it briefly, about there may be other potential things such as a caterer's thing or that sort of option. Uh, so that may have a better limitation. But um, ordinarily the... Uh, when it's an application for a license, which is what this is, um, I would think you would want to defer to the liquor commissioner. You know, it's presented to the council to vote up or down and so on. But well, they've, they, there's the uh, application has met the, you know, the baseline, therefore it comes forward like we present all applications, you well, know, in the normal, you know, just the normal I'll process. Just, I'll just go on to say that, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to approve this in any manner no no matter what petition is brought to me i've talked to the pastor beyond the church he has written me a letter um, that i can circulate to our council members i've talked to uh, a majority of the neighborhood association that live close to this vicinity and all of the support from this has come from outside of this community i respect them all highly but uh, i'm not changing my mind you could have the pope call me but i'm not changing my mind that's just where i'm at on it thank you Mary Francis and Beverly Helm Renfo. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Mary Francis, 400 West Cook Street. I do live in Vinegar Hill Neighborhood Association, Ward 5. And first, I want to thank Alderwoman Lakeisha Purchase for all her encouragement and support and for asking us to come here tonight. So no thank problem. you. So we have a new book out, and this is Beverly Helm Renfro, my co-author. This came out July 25th, African Americans in Springfield, and we just wanted to tell all of you about it, and we hope that you will consider purchasing it this evening. We do have plenty of copies. All of you, all of your wards are represented in this book, so there are pictures from every, every single ward, um, but there are, the most amount is in our ward. Um, auto woman purchase so we're proud of that Beverly um, grew up in Vinegar Hill there's a picture of her childhood home in here and I, of course I live in Vinegar Hill so Beverly's father was Doc Helm the famous photographer about two-thirds of the pictures in here are were taken by Doc Helm so here's Beverly this book has been a labor of love uh, it's been a long time coming <laughs> with everything that my dad has taken over the years. I'm still sorting through about 20,000 negatives to see what other books that we can come up with that show the history of this city from the African-American perspective. And we hope that you all will support us in this. 
Thank you. Yeah. And when is the, is there a book signing you said? Yes. We have books tonight. Oh, tonight. Tonight's the book signing. <laughs> it's official. <laughs> well, let us know when there's others and we can um, use our neighborhood news to put it out there. Things of that nature, okay? Thank you. Next is uh, Charlotte Johnson. Come up. <laughs> you must have really heard Miss Charlotte. <clears throat> As a result of a conversation earlier this evening, uh, Charlotte selected to delay her comments oh, okay. for a future meetings. So. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else wish to address the council? Uh, oh, Alice Rainey. Sorry, Alice. I want to thank you, Mayor, and City Council. But what I got to say may make some of you very mad or very happy, okay? I do believe that you guys are throwing money away for one vote, okay? I do believe that Ruby will handle that place with the highest respect and do it right. To throw money and tax money away when we need it so desperately is not in your realm. You should not be that way. And if one organization in any neighborhood demands you to vote no, don't throw your vote away because that's your vote to do what you want with it, no matter what, even if they don't vote for you again. I'm sorry that I said this, but I've heard a lot of this stuff from neighbors in, around, Ruby about what people were saying. I just don't sit on Livingston. My car gets filled every two days. I do a lot of driving. My car very seldom sits in the driveway. But I do believe when I see a city council that I have been sitting here for 28 years off and on to make a decision not to vote for it and throw money down the drain is a disgrace very much a disgrace. And I have seen this city council do it a lot. And very often, it may be the wrong thing to do. Plus, you got a bar on 13th Street and Cook. I've been in that bar many times, okay? When it was closed at 7 o'clock, I used to gamble there. Do you understand when it was on 18th and Cook? So I know that, okay? But I do believe that if you're gonna let them have their liquor license after the second time of having a shot shooting there, they need to be closed. And I need it right. Because if it means I have to walk that street and get petitions, I will. Because I think when you throw your vote away, you throw your dignity away. All of you have a beautiful day, and God bless you all. And thank you, Thank Mary. you. Motion to adjourn. Don't move. I think there's one more. Second the motion. Oh, sorry, never mind. Yeah. Come on. Yep. Come on up. You'd state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. Say it loud. Uh, hey. proud. <laughs> Good evening. I am Simona White. I reside at 330 South Durkin Drive, Springfield, Illinois, 62704. And I wish you all a very nice evening, and thank you for having me here. Well, you really didn't have me. I just came. <laughs> um... First of all, this month is Children's Cancer Awareness Month, and I am one of the researchers, Women Fighting Cancer of Illinois, and we will be having a balloon release at Children's Hospital Friday. Also, I have two real men wear pink, and I have something for them. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> Wonderful. Dang. How, about, how nice. What time, what time is the balloon release on Friday? It is going to be at 5 o'clock. And also, it's time for Lights of Hope. The National Lights of Hope in D.C. 
will be September the 8th. Roger will not be here because he's going to D.C. So Teresa and I will be doing the Lights of Hope. And we will be having two events. One, the very first one, will be at the pavilion at St. John's Hospital by the Cancer Institute. And then we will be having one on the 25th, um, combined with Route 66 and Recontact. And it will be like a wrap up. And we will have the big pink chair. And it will just be a big celebration to celebrate the survivors of children going into Real Men Wear Pink and Make His Rise Against Breast Cancer. In October the 8th is our Make His Rise Against Breast Cancer walk. It will be 8 o'clock until 4 at South Bend Park. I will get all of this together so that you guys have it. Okay. And um, see what else I need to talk about. They told me what to say, and I'm like, <laughs> tired, no Pepsi, but um, <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> but, um, oh, and yes, if you like to purchase Lights of Hope bags or anything, please get with me. Um, last year, all you guys were bronze sponsors. HSHS is our corporate sponsor again for the Lights of Hope and for researchers. So just get with me, and you can get your bags and everything. And last year, I would like to say we had over 300 bags out around the Pink Fountain. And um, this year, we will probably have more, but it's just very, very touching. And Mayor, I would like a favor to you. Could you please have the Fountain Pink by the 20th of September? Yeah, or we'll 25th, if There's you can. Certain colors. Uh that we can get, but we'll check with okay. Andrena. Okay, just let me know, mm -hmm. okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, and with your help last year, we were number three in the country wow. with the Lights of Hope. Oh, First was California. <laughs> First was California, then Ohio, then Illinois. And within Springfield, Illinois, we did $45,000. Roger, Susan Dannenberger, and I us three together. Wow. So with the help of all of you and everything, can we see if we can make it number one oh, this I, year? I Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. We're adjourned. Thank you.